Hello everyone, this is Fire Chief Paul Dow with Albuquerque Fire Rescue. Now this podcast is designed to bring you helpful training and best practices and some additional resources that you can access from anywhere. So thank you for joining us and enjoy today's episode. Good afternoon. Welcome to another exciting uh, podcast with uh, Albuquerque Fire Rescue. I'll be your host today, uh, Lieutenant John McGee, uh, hailing from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in for a treat uh, today. We have a special guest. We have uh, Dr. Daryl Macias uh, of Emergency Medicine. He is a master of many things. Uh, we can't get into all that today, but today we will talk about mountain medicine, also known as austere medicine. And uh, Dr. Macias, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lieutenant McGee. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Uh, so let's jump right into it, okay? Okay. So um, mountain medicine, I think there are different understandings of what that means, right? And even austere medicine, you know, when I before I became a medic years ago, I thought austere medicine was I could take this pen and, <laughs> and, and perform a, 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 a crike on you right. out in the mountains of Kentucky somewhere, um, you know, and, and use spring water to make an IV. And that's what I thought austere medicine was, use the tools you have. Is that correct? Well, that's partially correct. So that's interesting that you're mentioning this because one of the things that I actually teach now is how to improvise equipment. So what we call improvisational medicine. Gotcha. And, you know, how to be a MacGyver in certain situations. But austere medicine encompasses a lot of things. It could encompass mountain medicine, which is strictly limited to problems related to perhaps altitude, trauma, which is a big problem with regard to mountain medicine, search and rescue, survival, things like that. It has nothing to do with the beaches or anything like that. It's strictly mountain medicine. If you were to take wilderness medicine, then it would encompass maybe some of these other areas, uh, things in the desert, uh, medical issues that might uh, occur in a marine environment, in a jungle, wherever it is. And it may also incur, with regard to wilderness medicine, how do you take care of clients? Mountain medicine does too, but it tends to be more towards uh, rescue. When we talk about austere medicine, then you're using a whole bag of other ideas. It might be medicine in resource-limited settings, and it might use something like improvised medicine techniques. Uh, it might Use, so can I crack you with this pen? You you can. Actually, there are studies about that, and we've actually done labs on this to show that in only si certain situations does it work. So oh, it's possible, though. It is possible, oh my okay. but uh, and and what we've done with regard to like austere medicine, austere medicine also includes what we would call pre-hospital medicine or out-of-hospital medicine, okay. which might mean helicopter rescue services. Or what AFR does when they go out into the open spaces, you don't have all your equipment. You don't have your hospital things. You don't – well, now you're starting to have ECMO machines. Yeah. But when you're out there, you don't. You have what you carry. So it might be maybe a jump bag or something sure. like that. That's so austere. that could be considered austere? Absolutely. <clears throat> so how did you get into this? Give, give us a little bit of background, your background. Well, so I uh, had an interesting background. So I grew up in Los Angeles, in East Los Angeles. Uh, my dad was Mexican, and so – and uh, my grandfather was from Mexico, and he was a – cabbage and lettuce farmer, and then he opened up a bakery. And so, you know, my dad took over this bakery business, and, you know, I was inner city. But my parents were not together, so sometimes I would spend time with my mom. And then uh, we actually would also live in Compton, so wow. <laughs> we had a very varied story. And then, you know, my family situation wasn't that stable when I was growing up, so my grandparents actually raised me from age 10 on, and it was more of a white environment. And he was a physician, so he got me interested in the phys physician, being a physician, but also where he lived and where I was raised in the latter half of my, I guess, childhood was in a mountain community. So oh. the outdoors were very big to me, and I got exposed to things like hiking and climbing, and I took this upon myself. And then I would go on to, you know, do crazy things with climbing, and then some people would mentor me saying, you're doing that all wrong. You're 
you're going to die. And so I would do this, and then I would just take on more and more challenges. Then I would go on to UCLA, get into medical school, and I always thought, wow, I like the idea of mountain medicine or wilderness medicine. And in the day, at UCLA, being an ivory tower institution, people laughed at me saying, that is crazy. You'll never do that. And I had wanted to become a trauma surgeon, but then I decided uh, emergency medicine would actually fulfill some of this stuff. So I ended up just not knowing where I was going, not being mentored since wilderness medicine didn't really exist. So in the mid-90s, uh, after finishing my residency here at the University of New Mexico, I would uh, go into EMS. I would become medical director for several agencies, but also I would go on to develop what we know as wilderness medicine now at the University of New Mexico. Wow. Now, you were medical director of who here locally? Oh, locally. Who so for? I initially started with Isleta, just kind of, you know, wet my feet this uh, uh former uh, mentor, Paul Cheney, you may remember him yeah, or I heard of him, kind of Dr. said, Cheney. here's how you do it. And then I would go on to getting contracts with Rio Rancho. And so I became their medical director, Torrance County, uh, PHI helicopters. Now, was I mean, this when they were still, was it DHS? Was it back then? Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I go back a little ways. <laughs> right on. Yeah. And then I would also go on to become the medical director for Albuquerque Mountain Rescue Council, the AMRC. So mm. that's kind of my story with EMS and wilderness medicine. That's quite the jump. So East Los Angeles yeah. slash Compton yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Right. To UCLA. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you're here and you're doing all this cool stuff. Um, it's interesting. Though, I mean, how typical would it be? I'm just I can imagine on my own. Uh, you're a half Mexican kid. Mm -hmm. Right. In the middle of L.A. And somehow you end up in the mountains. Yeah. Like, do you think a lot of those kids have access like that? Oh, not even. I would think not. Not even. But here's the thing, is they don't know that they can have access. And now, you know, when we talk about the age of diversity and whatnot, sure. we're realizing, actually, this is a lot more complex. I mean, if you're a Hispanic kid or if you got a Hispanic family, I mean, what's important is putting uh, food on the table. It's er earned income. Yes, and sir. going out to a ski resort and all that, that's just, you know, for them rich white folks, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. But now what we're trying to do, even uh, with this group I belong to, the Wilderness uh, Medical Society, and even UNM is we're trying to encourage other people, these are the outdoors. It's really good for your inner self and to just get out there. So I think now, even with regard to advertisement and all, uh, and all that, we're, you know, choosing people of color who are able to, you know, see a role model maybe on a commercial for REI or something like that. And, hey, you know, that guy looks like me. I want to do that. So it's just about inspiring people. Is that, that why you're do. so outspoken about it? Well, I'm to outspoken. To inspire them? Because, I mean, a lot of people right. wouldn't go into their, you know, their heritage or ethnicity, right? But you've been pretty open about that. Oh, I'm proud you? of it. Yeah, and maybe young kids or somebody else may hear that and say, wait, wait a minute, he can do that? Oh, right on. Right, oh, maybe, right yeah. on. Yeah. And especially here in New Mexico, you know, got a large Hispanic population. Go for it. Don't be limited. I've never was limited. I've always taught other people that I mentor, don't be limited by a limited imagination. Just reach out for what you got. All you can do is fail. Gotcha. So, all right, let's, let's, let's get into the weeds a little bit here. Okay. So when we're talking about wilderness medicine, I mean, there's got to be curriculum. Mm. Is this a, a certified program? Do you get licensed? Is it a degree program? How does the curriculum or the uh, credentialing work? Oh, yeah, let's go for the weeds. Well, there's a couple of uh, things for pre-hospital providers, for instance. You can become what we would call a wilderness uh, first aid person. That's for somebody who may not even have any pre-hospital experience. You could advance on to wilderness first responder, which is more advanced. And these are certified courses. They're not necessarily as regimented as, you know, what we might, you know, use in the uh, Department of Transportation or something like that. Mm -hmm. None of that curricula. Uh, but it is, uh, there is a consensus of how people should be trained. There are minimum requirements, standards, and whatnot that, at least in the United States, that we all agree on. And then you can go on further, and there are several courses uh, geared towards physicians, so it might be a wilderness, advanced life support, things like that, that again, doesn't have a certifying body, but okay. it does exist. And then if you're a physician, or even now here in North America, not in Europe, but in North America, if you're a paramedic or a nurse or um, APP, you can embark on something called the Diploma of Mountain Medicine, and it has stringent standards by which, you know, people will 
adhere to to obtain this diploma. And we actually have a diploma here at our UNM International Mountain Medicine Center. We're actually uh, heading all the DIM programs, what we call DIM programs, DIM programs, throughout the United States. So that is really exciting. And then there's what we would call a Wilderness Medicine Fellowship. And so there's a consortium of us. I'm one of the Wilderness Medicine Directors uh, for the United States uh, academic wow. programs. And we have agreed on a certain set of curricula. We don't have a certificate, but usually it's about a year program for somebody who finished either emergency medicine or family medicine, and then they embark on this program for a year and they're fellowship trained. And where do they go? What's the application? What's the practical application? So the practical application is a lot of these people want to do expedition medicine, which is really hard still. Expedition be- Expedition. So going to K2, Shishapangma, Everest, things like that. That's still a very small niche, but we find for instance, in the Wilderness Medical Society, where people ask me, how do I get on an expedition? Still, it is who you know. Uh, If there is a company, a commercial company, that's willing to hire you, great. You've got the qualifications, perhaps, because you've obtained a Diploma of Mountain Medicine uh, certificate, or maybe you've been fellowship trained, great. But there's also other things, such as global humanitarian Hmm. uh, types of assistance that you can embark on as a fellowship trained person. You can also do academics. Uh, You can also become a medical director for search and rescue team. So there's all kinds of applications. So speaking of the expedition, I have some notes here. Um, Have you climbed Everest? I don't want to climb Everest. I've been up to Everest, like there's the base camp. But it, but now with so much commercialization and oh. you can get to the top if you pay, you know, for me, you know, I guess my ethics are a little different. But, you know, I'm thinking there are millions of people who could use $200,000 to put food on their table to feed their family. I can't see paying a house mortgage to have somebody haul me up to the top. It's That's just an ethical thing. cost to go to Everest? It's about a hundred. It's about a hundred thousand dollars. However, I will say that the Sherpas that we have actually trained in the Kumbu Climbing Center in a village near Everest Base Camp called Fort Say, we've trained them because we want them to be safe. The, you know, the Sherpas. You trained the Sherpas, really? Yes. So, what, what, what do you mean? Train them in what? So, you know, Sherpas, if you go to Everest in the Everest region, climb some of these large mountains as a Westerner, you'll usually maybe you know, sign up with uh, maybe a a mountain guide company, whatever they are. And I won't mention their names, so I don't, you know, advertise. But anyways, a lot of times they use local Sherpas because they know the area. Uh, In the Nepalese government, it's, you know, required to, you know, have Sherpas a lot of times. It's more so in Pakistan, K2 and things like that. You have somebody called a Sirdar, but you have you know, a Nepalese person who can represent you really well. And then I- invariably, a lot of these Sherpas are climbers, and they make a lot of money guiding clients up places like Everest. But in the past, they th- and their needs had been ignored. Maybe they wouldn't have the right equipment. They would be climbing up, you know, these peaks with, you know, flip-flops, things like that. Wow. So with the Kumbu Climbing Center, which was uh, started by, um, uh, it was called the Alex Lowe Charitable Foundation, and it was in honor of a friend of mine, Alex Lowe, who died in an avalanche. Um, anyways, this fund was started to train Sherpas, technical rescue, technical skills, so that they could guide people competently up these mountains, and also medical skills. So wow. That's and you're the medical director for that center? For for the KCC. You know, they have many medical directors and whatnot, so I've just been one of them. And myself with another physician, Jake Jensen, have actually done initiatives where we would actually teach the Nepalese uh, wilderness first responder courses and things like that. That is the most bizarre. I would <laughs> ne- <laughs> This L.A. kid... Now you're in Nepal. Right. And Latin America, too. And Latin America. Yeah. So, but the <laughs> Nepalese, that's a, it's a very, very conservative kind of isolated place. I mean, are you working in conjunction with the Nepalese government? Not necessarily. No? So the Alex Lowe Charitable Foundation, the Kumbu Climbing Center, is a non-governmental uh, okay. type of foundation. And you can work with them. And really, the, the Nepalese government doesn't require a lot. A lot of what 
this group has done is they've worked with the Nepalese government, but uh, the governments in that part of the world, they're a little loose, and if you just give them enough money, they'll, you know, basically say, sure, why don't you do that? Now, that's a little different from being an expedition guide leader for a commercial company. Then you do have to pay some royalties to the government. That makes tourism. sense. Yeah. Is this all benevolent, pretty much? I mean, do you want to be responsible to the Sherpas and also the climbers that come in? I'm saying your efforts, like, why do you care? Well, my efforts are, yeah, many, many fold. Number one, I have a, you know, personal relationship with those who founded KCC, Conrad Anchor and whatnot. And we had, we have some, uh, you know, shared uh, commonalities in our past with regard to climbing. But also, yes, I like to also give Nepalis the chance. I, you know, worked over there in the early 2000s in the emergency department to develop wow. emergency medicine there. And so I kind of have this love for Nepalis. And I also am able to give uh, other people under my tutelage uh, potentials, possibilities, uh, training opportunities internationally to work with the KCC. Are you still active there now? I am, except last year it was canceled because kind of, of COVID. Weird, but kind of, a, kind of a weird year, right? <laughs> right. Um, so we, let's, let's, let's jump a little bit because we could spend a lot of time on that. Um, search and rescue, right? So I know we had a USAR team here uh, in New Mexico that started probably in the 80s, mm-hmm. I'm thinking. It developed, it kind of got pretty big, and I think at its height was probably around 9-11, right? Mm-hmm. They were being deployed all around the country. Um, were you involved? Uh, not with- not directly with the USAR. So I was actually on the Disaster Medical Assistance Team, the DMAT team, Okay. And that I didn't put in this bio here, but I was involved with them for uh, you know many years. And so you couldn't be part of the DMAT and USAR, but I would train with them down at their station. I would take my wilderness medicine students during my one month long rotation. We would train with USAR and do some crazy things. But USAR has obviously changed, you know, governmentally speaking and with regard to what they have available. And so has DMAT. And so, yeah, things have, you know, definitely changed. So I'm no longer involved with DMAT directly, but have been on some wonderful deployments. And you said that, like, I guess the way we operate here is different uh, than Europe? For search and rescue, yes. So search and rescue in Europe and pre-hospital medicine, if you will, was physician uh, driven. So this was what we call the Franco-German model. And I actually worked with SAMU in France as part of a sabbatical about 12 years ago. So I got to actually be the physician on EMS calls and we were doing ultrasound. I mean, this stuff was cutting edge before wow. we even thought of it. They're, you know, doing open thoracotomies, just crazy stuff. Just ask, you know, Lady Diana, unfortunately. And, you know, there's some uh, interesting things that you could argue against the efficacy of that model. Mm-hmm. But as um, I've, you know, trained in Europe and done search and rescue. I see a lot of validity with having a physician on the scene. And so when I was directing uh, with Rio Rancho, whenever my schedule could allow, I would go on calls with them, which is really nice. And now with the EMS Consortium, that's kind of de rigueur, if sure. you will. Yeah. But in the United States, uh, a lot of our search and rescue, it was really volunteer search and rescue with the Mountain Rescue Association. So you have a professionalized group in Europe, which was big into mountaineering and it was very highly regarded where in America, even back in the seventies, you know, climbers were regarded as kind of this hippie fringe. And so, you know, you had people like us in our uniforms and then you had uh, these guys in Europe that were also professionalized and you had the hippie pack. But what's happened over the years is, especially with regard to wilderness medicine and search and rescue, the North Americans, the uh, Americans specifically, and the Europeans have collaborated. And so right now what we see even locally in Albuquerque, we've got, you know, great training. We've professionalized our search and rescue. Obviously, this is not universal throughout the U.S., but Albuquerque is great. So you've got you guys, AFR, you've got Mm -hmm. your rescue units. You go out to the open space. You're working in collaboration with uh, the open space uh, uh, Albuquerque Police Department. I mean, what great collaboration. You know, when... uh, I don't know if you know, we've just trained three of their officers in our... uh, EMT basic program. Oh, that's great. Three of the open space cops just for that reason. That is so nice. Yeah. Because, you know, police don't like to necessarily do medical stuff. But, no, it's great. What you well, yeah, and I think we see the need to merge now, right? We're right. working collaboratively, so they need to know what we know. and We need to know a little bit about uh, their considerations. So, like, that is so amazing that you've been to all these places and kind of comparing. And now you see the U.S. and Europe, and we're kind of getting together and, I guess— what's the word regulating 
almost. Well, regulate, right. And, and this speaks to, yeah, being able to work together because, you know, in the initial phases, I was with AMRC and then, you know, we would see, you know, Albuquerque Fire Department, as it was known in the day, kind of go out there and we're like, you know, we've never really worked together and there would be some difficulties and then the police would show up. But now with all the training and the uh, searches that have occurred, you know, everybody has come together and now you've got the inclusion of the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office. It has a helicopter. with their bird. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the way they do it in Europe. They just go on a helicopter, pluck somebody off with a long haul or short but haul. I've seen some boom. crazy stuff online with those guys in Europe. They're like a foot away from the face of a mountain, a <laughs> sheer face. Right? I saw one the other day. The guy just re- he never got off the bird. He just reached out. That's how close they yeah. were to grab somebody. That's I've been told by a local expert here that we just don't fly enough in the states. We're not as proficient. Like we're not that good. Would you agree to that? Correct, but we're getting good. So the BCSO, who you know we're a, a part of with the International Mountain Medicine Center, mm-hmm. uh, we train with Air Zermatt, these guys that you were talking about. So we have a personal relationship with Air Zermatt. And so a few, you know, Justin Spain. Yeah, that's Justin, who I was referring to. Yeah, he was, he was out there. He I, took yeah. us, you know. Uh, I saw the video 20 yeah, times. Yeah, crazy. So, you know, we've sent some of our providers, you know, they've gone out there yeah. to, you know, the Matterhorn, Zermatt, Switzerland. And now they come here and we have this collaborative effort to where we're professionalizing helicopter rescue because that rescue a few years ago that happened with the guy the MI up at Elena Gallegos Mm -hmm. well you know that was so good because you have you know AFR out there you know getting to the guy having the life pack and then you know hauling the guy at least 40 minutes until they could do a rendezvous with BCSO who rendezvoused with PHI the guy got his thrombolytics and or his uh, cath in three hours at press and boom he was saved what that, that's a great story. That's a great story. That's what we want. <laughs> right. Do you fly at all? Uh, I used to fly. Used to fly. I used to fly with PHI, with BCSO. Um, I'm letting the other people kind of fly because I'm doing a lot of other education and I'm sure. letting my fellow fly because, you know, they still don't quite have enough room, but I've done some things with them, but I'm not on missions with them now. You've done some things with them. I think that's fascinating. Uh, so, <clears throat> and then you were talking, we were talking a little bit about, you know, the austere medicine training unified right mm-hmm. versus not unified mm-hmm. um sometimes i wonder if you know things that are regulated or unified they kind of become homogenous and you lose some creativity right and do i wonder with medicine mm-hmm. is it sometimes better to keep it kind of open source where people can innovate wow. when you're unified it gets it gets you know kind of takes some of the art the, the, the soul out of it that's in, that's interesting. You know why? Because yeah. I teach a lot, right? And we tell right. them EMT basics all the time. Right. They read the book, and if they can't find it in the book, they're stumped. But I told them, you walked in here with a brain. Mm. Why forfeit your brain? This is a cookbook. You're a chef. Right. Right? These are right. just guidelines, but you don't. this isn't your life. It, they're just guidelines. So I'm wondering, even with mountain medicine, which would take a great deal of creative thinking, right? Mm. I, I couldn't even imagine. Just to improvise like that? Um if it's unified, it gets standardized, and I know we want some of that. Right. So people don't, you know, do crazy things, but at the same time, do you minimize creativity? Well, you know, it's interesting because if I could go back to EMS and to some of our, you know, uh, pre-hospital providers, you've got a set of protocols, and I think our protocols in Bernalillo County are, you know, very progressive. I mean, I remember, you know, working in L.A., and to be a paramedic, you had to call the MCEP to be able to intubate. That's just crazy. Here, you know, we've got a lot of special skills and whatnot, so I think the creativity here is exemplary. You have to have creativity. You have to actually have both because you're going to have some people that go out off the the loose end and whatnot, and they need that structure. But you sure. have to be able to have leaders that are able to think creatively, but also, you know, think a little bit inside the box or have a good collaboration. And I think you can work really well. You don't think that's accentuated with uh, mountain medicine? You know, just because you're in this, you know, extreme environment. Right. And none of the can, even for us pre hospital, you know, I tell the students all the time, where's your office? What's behind 7 Eleven? <laughs> it's in somebody's living room, right? You don't have, it's not a clinical setting. So you're going to have to make adjustments. With the context we're talking about here, that's, that's even more 
uh, you know, extreme. Well, you have to have some sense of, you know, organization in a place. But what we do find is with regard to stress, I mean, in mountain medicine, we work with potentially very stressful environments. Yes. If you don't have a set of things that you have memorized, uh, if you will, mnemonics like ABC, that's sure. a common thing. You're going to panic and maybe do breathing before airway because your brain is just on, you know, cognitive overload. So you have to figure out some way to decrease cognitive overload by having a certain amount of accepted standards and then you debrief and then you can figure out did this go well did this not go well do we change our system or not based on that but I think it's probably better to err on the side of maybe more protocol and more standardization and then bring out the creativity because if you're too creative you're going to have a bunch of people doing a bunch of crazy things it's going to be like herding cats or goats whatever you like to use yeah I, I understand what you're saying um and then, like, when we look at stress desensitization, what does that mean? So stress desensitization, when we're let, – let's take an example of failed airway, for instance, and you guys may know that. That's what I want to get into. All right, let's go. Um, uh, so failed airway, you got three attempts, you failed at airway, are you going to go for the crike? And, you know, sometimes we've had people where we can't crike them as well. What do you do? And that's very stressful. If you don't have uh, the prior training in this sort of thing and you're in a high-stakes environment, then you're going to be lost. So what uh, – stress desensitization does is it exposes the individual previously to similar experiences so they can kind of get their mind on load. And one of the uh, famous examples I have is when I was here uh, probably about eight years ago, we did a uh, tactical medicine course and they Mm -hmm. did that beautifully. And, you know, they would stress us out with all kinds of things, but we had to work through it. And then we would have to be throwing the flashbangs at people and all that. Oh yeah. That was so fun. Nope. Not my environment. (laughs) (laughs) But, but what you're doing is in, in medicine or pre-hospital medicine, it's the same thing and then you review it and then what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to stop so in throws a panic you stop and you try to kind of breathe through it so tactical breathing is very important because you've got to calm yourself Mm -hmm. down all those hormones that are going crazy the epinephrine and that comes with practice and then what you do is you try to you know think through the situation you visualize it you see yourself doing good and then you do the training and then hopefully even with a novel experience you could take what you've learned and apply it to a new experience like well I can't even crack this person what do I do now and admittedly it isn't perfect but if you can practice this stress desensitization we could do a whole podcast on how that's actually done that seems to really help people how do you replicate the environment of like high altitude because that's different right let's say you're you're slightly hypoxic right and you're rescuing this guy and maybe you're not even thinking clearly yourself how do you replicate that here So what we've done, like, for instance, in a hypoxic environment, we have a hypobaric chamber where maybe I've gone to 18,000 feet and I've had somebody uh, tell me to do a certain amount of tasks, like maybe a rope rescue rig or something like that, and I had to do that. And then I come down and I do it again, or maybe it's just training up in the Sandias or somewhere else. And we actually take some of our students in our Diploma Mountain Medicine program, and we do a hypoxia lab. So what we do is we take them up to a high-altitude environment. might be 11,000 feet. They exercise, then they have to do these certain skills. We'll also do it in what we call our hypothermia lab, where we freeze these individuals. And they have to actually have a suffer fest. Ice tub? Ice tub. Yeah, baby! It's a suffer fest, or they do exercise (laughs) in in a steam room or something like that so we this is our stress desensitization so that hopefully when you're exposed in that environment you'll hopefully perform better yeah i can i'm just as you're saying that picture like loss of dexterity right nothing works how do we work through this what skills can i do until i fall a little bit um wow yeah and that gets into like survival medicine and things like that how do you keep yourself alive and how do you keep other people alive and I like to use the rule of three so you've got three seconds if you don't stop and if you succumb to panic you're going to kill yourself so three seconds you're going to die you know and some people might jump off the cliff they're just panicked and then you have to work through the next three minutes the three minutes the priority survival priority is oxygen so this may not apply it may apply to a high altitude environment okay but that first three seconds so I I what, three seconds to calm myself down? Exactly. Okay. Stop. Because people in a survival or a real bad situation, they panic. So you do the uh, mnemonic stop, and that's where you stop doing what you're doing, think what you're doing, organize uh, whatever you have around you, and then carry out your plan. Do your plan and stick to it. That works with street medicine, too. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Jumping off that rig. <sighs> worked up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, let's go for it, cowboy. Yeehaw!
uh-uh. Mm-mm. <laughs> but those things are learned uh, through experience, right? You screw it up enough, and then you realize, well, most of us, right? Right. It's empirical. Right. I've seen enough. Now I need to slow down. And, you know, we, we say take a minute to make a minute. Exactly. Right? Exactly. But hopefully with training, simulated training, you can kind of cut down those incidences, and so that's what we're about. Give me the threes again, Doc. Three seconds. Okay, so you got three seconds to okay. calm yourself down or you're going to die. Three okay. minutes to get oxygen, whether you're in a, you know, maybe a, a, a rescue at the Rio Grande or something like that. Make sure, you know, you have plenty of oxygen. Uh, you know, you have oxygen if you're in a high-altitude environment. Descend. you got three minutes for oxygen. You've got, then the next priority, if you're ever lost, you're not going to go out and say, well, you know, I'm lost. i got to go catch me an elk. No, 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 no. you got three hours to take care of hypothermia. So that may involve, you know, a shelter, proper clothing, you know, fire done, you know, carefully, of course, but warming yourself out and your patient up. And then you've got three days to worry about water, water procurement, three weeks to be able to f- figure out how you're going to get your food source. And then three months, you know, it's not going to happen around here, but where you're lost and you have to somehow get found. Three months without love and people have been documented to what did Kill you just themselves. say? Yeah. Three months without love, man. You mean my love tank is only three months deep? It's three months deep, baby. Okay. That's all you got. So you better fill up that love bank. <laughs> I'll work on it immediately. Okay. Well, wait a minute. That is so crazy. So three days. So why three hours for shelter? Because people will die of hypothermia without heat. How about long? three hours. Three about three hours. hours. Okay. Or if you're hyperthermic, you know, you're out in the heat, three hours. Three hours. Yeah, and that's rough, you know. Okay, I got three days for water. Mm-hmm. That makes perfect sense. Now, if I'm in this high-altitude environment, wouldn't I have water all around me in the form of snow or ice? Not always. Not in, a, you know, in the Tibetan Plateau, for instance. It's really dry, so dry. you may not. Gotcha. You may not. Okay, so we can't assume that. Three weeks for food, and that's – I can go three weeks without a meal. You can go three weeks. You're going to be suffering. It'll hurt. So and another thing I actually do for my students, I say you should fast for three days. Just suffer through it. See how you Just do. Just to see how that feels? Exactly. No water, food, nothing? Well, no, I, I've done that. That was a stupid idea without water. I hurt became yourself. sinkable. <laughs> you hurt yourself. <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with you? All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, three weeks without food, and then the big one, three months – without love isolation and failure to thrive you don't care anymore you lose hope you lose hope you stop yeah. trying you stop trying is that the final three it seems like it would be. that's all i know <laughs> yeah, three years to get your act right your career right i don't know <laughs> okay that is so that is, uh, yeah that's so interesting so have you yourself ever been in a real life survival uh situation yeah yeah definitely a couple times i remember um one time, I was climbing this 3,000-foot monolith cliff called El Capitan in Yosemite, and my friend I've and I, it. we were right in the middle of this, about 2,000 feet, and this blizzard came on the end of May, and we were having to repel, and we would have, you know, in the day, the uh, the bolts, the things that are in the rocks were not as safe. That was pretty harrowing. One time, I got lost in the desert outside of Las Vegas, where it was 110 degrees, and I actually had to break open a cactus because there was no water out there. Is that and Death I, Valley? Where is that? Uh, so Red Rocks is just, it's about 20 miles outside of Vegas, okay. Las Vegas. And then Death Valley is probably about three hours northwest of there. So you were just out there stomping around? And- I was out there, you know, in my, you know, ignorant uh, phase as a college student uh, doing a, what they call a solo climb where I would climb a 500-foot cliff by myself. I knew how to do that, but what I did is I left my backpack on the lower end of this cliff so I wouldn't have to chug it up because it was about 60 pounds, and I thought, I'm just going to put it on this large rock, a big uh, landmark rock, so that when I get to the top, I'll be able to see spot my... spot it. Yeah, and there were thousands of those similar you size lost rocks. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that was a very seminal moment for me. Never take your pack off. Never take your pack off or have a survival kit, always. So, Doc, let me ask you a couple of questions that, you know, is just personal interest of mine. So you mentioned that you had been in a couple of um, survival situations yourself, and I know you know how to, you know, you were young then. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do some things differently now. Um, Talk to me a little bit about gear. Let's say I'm I'm going out. Survival gear? Yeah. Let's say I'm going out. I'm going to do a solo climb. I don't know why, but I'm, I'm going... What am I taking? 
Well, do you know? Do you remember the ten essentials from Boy Scouts? Yeah. No, sir. Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But if you could, my my take is we've talked about the rule of threes. If you can base a survival kit based on the rule of threes, and with each component that you have, you have two backups, meaning you have three ways to, for instance, start a fire. Interesting. Okay. It's the way to go. So, for instance, in this afternoon, I'm actually teaching this uh, international course on survival medicine on this very thing. For instance, let's talk about keeping warm, the fire idea. Okay, so what I do is I usually tell people, don't start a fire with matches. Now, first of all, we're not, I don't encourage you to do this right now in fire season or anything like that. But, you know, you lose your manual dexterity with fine motor skills in your hand when you're cold. So matches aren't reliable. So what I might do is I use a fire striker. Case. And that's a ferro rod. With a knife. So you do want to add a knife and duct tape to your Oh, I, don't, I shouldn't get a flint deal? and. Well, that's a flint, yeah. That's okay. what we call a, a ferro rod. It's ferro basically rod. a flint and steel. That's totally reliable. That's worked with me in every environment 100% of the time. I've been snowed on. I've been in the jungle, whatever it is. That is good stuff. But there's also chemical means to start a fire, too. Uh, might be magnesium. might be something called potassium permanganate that I might carry because I can use potassium permanganate, this weird chemical. I could potentially sterilize water, and I could use it for signaling as well in snow. Uh, potassium permanganate. Wow. Yeah. Okay. But, but it's a little weird thing. Uh, you know, some people may not recommend it. Um, and then uh, what's another way to start a fire? It might be from uh, I'll carry maybe a little uh, magnifying lens or something like that in my wallet. And so I've got three ways to start a fire. Um, what about a BIC? A BIC could work, but it's not as reliable because you're having to use your thumb, sure. which is potentially frozen, and you're not going to get a spark. But if you have it, I mean, bring it. Good. But it doesn't always work very well. Gotcha. You know, but uh, having a survival kit isn't the all end because you have to have like something to start a fire so you could potentially use the cotton that's maybe in a medical kit in a pill bottle or something like that but the cotton should have vaseline so that if it rains or something like that the cotton isn't all mushy and is useless but that vaseline will not only keep that water from contaminating that cotton and stopping it from causing a fire but also it burns a lot longer Gotcha. So, so, so anyways, if you could do something that will, you know, you're not going to take oxygen with you and you're not going to take Valium for your panic disorder. No, <laughs> but, <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe you uh, will. I don't know. <laughs> maybe you will. But, you know, uh, be able to start a fire and shelter. Have three ways to do that. Have three ways to procure and purify water, be it boiling, which is from your fire, okay. be it from chemical means. Uh, iodine, potassium, permanganate, whatever, and you know you can actually use what we call a steri pin. You can actually put this plastic bottle out in the sun for a day, and it will at least you know cook it. It'll, it'll cook it, but it won't be good the next day. Uh, a water pump filter is always good as well. Um, and then as far as food, I might carry uh, what we call paracord, 550 paracord sure. that has seven strands uh, and uh, something called snare wire, which is basically hobby wire. And I can uh, show people how to start a, uh, how to build a trap. For small animals. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna trap game now. Oh, we're gonna we could trap game. Listen, whatever it I, is. I see naked and afraid, and it's impossible <laughs> to trap game. <laughs> oh, it's hard. You have to practice this stuff. Okay. Because this is all perishable skills. But if you have those essentials that will help you with the rule of threes, and then if you have a knife, because a knife isn't included in this rule of threes necessarily, but it helps. As soon as you need a, I mean, why pack a bag if you don't put a knife? <laughs> <clears throat> Am I taking a big bag? Big no, because you won't carry it with you. Really? You will I'll not abandon the bag. Yeah, a lot of hunters, and I've taken like this hunting class because I've done bow hunting. You know, they teach these. You know, oh, this is a survival kit, and they bring out this humongous bag that nobody is going to really carry with them. You know, it's like this is too heavy. I'm just going to lay this down. If you don't have it with you, you don't have it, and you're going to die. So I take a real small bag that I'm proficient in using because I practiced this before, I can go anywhere. In fact, one time we were out on a ski trip and it got to be 25 below with a group of uh, emergency medicine residents. And I told these guys as I was learning survival skills, uh, you know, we're in Crested Butte going from Crested Butte to Aspen, 25 miles uh, ski in, ski out. And I said, I'm going to catch up with you guys at the quarter of noon or something like that you guys go ahead get your early start you have your maps and all that kind of stuff because i wanted to test my survival skills and i had a small backpack no 
um, sleeping bag, uh, no tent. I had a tarp. All I had was, you know, basically a little food, had water purification, my survival kit, a large knife, because I can use a large knife for many things, and a tarp. And I slept out 25 below in a shelter that I made with fire, and I slept great till 6 a.m. However, when I woke up the next morning, this... Your, your leg was missing. Yeah, but yeah, it's a few toes, but, you know, you can transplant them, you know? <laughs> okay. No, no this one ahead. guy built a snow cave, and he was totally wet and cold and in moderate hypothermia, so we had to warm him up. It was amazing. But you didn't get wet because you had the tarp. I didn't get wet. Uh, yeah, and it, that's a very complicated story, but this stuff works. It seems counterintuitive to not take the big bag, you know, just in case. Right. You know, I never know what I might need. Um, and I don't recommend people listening to this start with that. Sure. I've had to train gradually, maybe uh, out in my backyard and then maybe 100 feet where I live in the open space and gradually increase my level of confidence. But you don't just say, yeah, I'm going to do what this guy is saying on the podcast and go out with a knife and, you know, maybe a firearm if you go into weird places and do this because it does take practice that's interesting you brought up firearm i hadn't thought about that angle but <clears throat> it probably should food you said a little food so yeah i brought some energy bars things like that um you know it is it is actually a good idea i don't go out without food i'll take maybe some chocolate bars that some are really delicious they're high energy and some disgusting chocolate bars well, <laughs> That I don't want to eat because, you know. So the disgusting ones are the ones you won't eat a lot of. Right. Now, I, I think I read in Europe, some of the, uh, like like Finland and some of these colder places, and the survival packs or the MREs for their soldiers, uh -huh. they always add chocolate. Right. For that reason. Right. Well, you know, the MREs, that's an interesting story with regard to the chocolate because it, uh, at least in the American MREs, had a laxative in it because when you eat that brick food that's in an MRE, you're going to get constipated, and that chocolate had a little laxative effect. So really? it helped you go. Yep. Wow. I, know <clears throat> I think the Americans, they put peach cobbler um, and all that stuff. So yeah. and then what else am I taking? So you said three of each to accommodate for all the, the rule of three. So I want three ways to do all these things. Um, how much water? Water's heavy. So water's heavy. So if you can, so and this is going to be the same for you know a potential rescue. Yeah. Is that you don't want to just go out there and say yeehaw I'm ready to go. You want to take your time and use whatever software you have available, your Gaia or something like that. If you can get coordinates from you know um, the incident commander, you know, maybe police, they can do triangulation or something like that. You're going to take those coordinates and you're going to look at them on your mapping software and you get an idea of what you want to want to do. Well, in the same way, if you're planning on going somewhere, you're going to try to figure out, okay, here's some water sources. Now, having said that, you may be lost and you didn't plan that way, so you can't find a spring, you can't find a river, but there's something called a solar still that's taught in every survival solar book, still. and it doesn't work out here. It's basically where you dig this two to three foot hole, you put a clear plastic bag over it, and after a day, if you have a collection device, you're going to get water from the ground. It really doesn't work, but there's something called a transpiration bag where you take a non-toxic tree, a pine tree or something like that, and you airtight seal with a clear plastic bag without holes. Uh, this You put this bag around a bough of a pinion pine, you tie it up, and in several hours, you'll have like a cup of water. Really? Yeah, that's improvising, and it works. And no, my, that's in the extreme if I don't have water. When I go out, shouldn't I take water? You should definitely take water. How much water should I take? Boy, it's going to depend. So for, you know, search and rescue, it depends on the season and whatnot. But, you know, some people may say maybe a gallon a day. But that's going to depend on, you know, the temperature, the exertion. And what I recommend to people is there isn't a hard and fast rule. It's going to depend on what you're used to. So train in a given environment beforehand to determine your water needs. A loosely scaled indication of you not getting enough water is when your urine turns amber. That's kind of been one sure. of those survival things that may not have evidence-based literature behind it. But, you know, if you're thirsty, you probably have enough water. You're already dehydrated. Water. Exactly. If you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. Gotcha. And then a couple more questions. So gear, let's say cold environment. Mm -hmm. Layers or one big fat parka? Mm, that's excellent. So first of all, cotton is rotten. 
cotton is rotten. Cotton is rotten. You don't take cotton with you because if you get wet, like if you're out there on a rescue or you're skiing and you get all sweaty on your cotton, you're going to be wearing that wetness. It does not wick up. It does not um, uh, go out into the environment. Whereas if you're using some of these more synthetic fabrics like Gore-Tex or whatever, it'll actually transpire the perspiration away from you. But kind of an old trick that I've used in really cold environments is to take plastic bags. So my hands get cold. I'll use the nitrile gloves that I use in medicine. I'll put it on my hands. I'll put my glove under it. I am warm. You do the same with your feet. Uh, you could actually wear plastic bags to conserve sweat. Now, Obviously, you're going to wear that sweat, so you want to yeah, dry you're off. Yeah, wearing that sweat. You're right, but it keeps you warm, and really? you don't get that. The and the worst way to get cold is through that convection, that wind. Wind is killer. So if it's cold outside, but it's a still day, that's fine. But the wind will kill you. So that, and then several small layers that you can don and doff off. A big parka isn't going to cut it unless you're, you know, up six thousand feet, twenty thousand feet in elevation, or six thousand meters, I should say. So layers better. Layers better. Now you mentioned <clears throat> you've been in the jungle what am i looking at in the jungle do i want long sleeves to use that perspiration and to evaporate and cool me off or do i want to be you know shirtless? actually yeah no you don't want to be shirtless and you know letting it all hang out and here's why because there's a lot of bugs out there and there's sun so generally what we recommend is if you use shirts you use some that have this universal protection factor this uh you know the sun protection factor you talk about with uh you know maybe sunscreen sunscreen yeah clothes have the same rating and so it depends on the tightness of the weave and things like that but also if you could put something called permethrin on it it'll stop those insects from biting you say that again permethrin permethrin never permethrin. heard of that is that yeah. like a, is it a repellent or it's, it's a, a repellent it's a she will it work on skeeters Skeeters. Works on skeeters. Good. I live down by the river. Thanks for that you tip. You live by the river. Yeah. Oh, good. We got to get... Yeah. No, exactly. So what you're trying to do is, you know, mosquitoes are big carriers of not only malaria, yellow fever, dengue. Those are awful. You're awful. dropping some gems here, Woo, Doug. Baby. Yeah. Appreciate that. So, <laughs> and then let's say in this environment, jungle, whatever, uh, what are some... So heat exhaustion, right? That seems obvious to me. Mm -hmm. Things like that. These are hot places, right? Yeah. What are some other things I'd be looking for in a tropical environment? So with regard, if anybody was to go in a tropical environment, so we find that uh, bigger individuals with an increased uh, BMI, I can say that delicately, uh, they do well in cold environments because they're sure. insulating their core. Sure. But in hot environments, you know, like muscular individuals too, they tend to do worse. And a lot of the people who live in the jungles are actually very thin mm -hmm. because they can dissipate that heat. So really being in shape is really good. Heat training, exercise and heat training. We've taken people out to this race called the Badwater 135. And, you know, we've tried to exercise in 110 degree heat. It's awful. But we find that uh, heat, you develop this weird protein in your body called heat shock proteins. And in so doing, heat shock proteins, heat shock proteins this is another tangent that we've actually studied here at UNM, but you find that, you know, people who exercise and then exercise in the heat are more resistant to heat and also to altitude partially. So this is really exciting. Um, guy, what was the other question? How do you prepare for heat or whatever? Drink a lot of water. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to a tropical environment, so how do I prepare? What am I right. doing? So drink a lot of water. Uh, you know, some people might get a little too hot. So if you're in a hot environment, generally you don't want to travel during the middle of the day when it's hotter. That's a big thing. Being in the jungle is very strange because you've got this thing called a canopy. You've got these humongous trees, two, three hundred feet high. You can't see the mountains. The thing I love about Albuquerque is I know where the Sandias are. I know where I'm at. Yeah. But uh, out there, you are lost. So one of the things that you should prepare for is learn how to use a map and compass. A GPS is good. A cell phone is good. But if you don't have, um, you know, adequate uh, satellite communication, if you got a huge cloud cover, or if you're in the middle of this dense, thick canopy you gotta jungle, you got to go analog. You got to go analog. So mastering a map and compass, doing old school, is great, and it, it helps with that three month problem that I addressed in the rule of three. What's threes. your tech like when you go out? <clears throat> um, you're taking that phone. I'm taking the phone. You, what about the smartwatch? Yeah, I might, I might take a smartwatch. Yeah, absolutely. The problem with this this smartwatch, though, it's only good for, like, what, 24 hours or something like oh, that? Oh, yeah, without a, without a charge. Yeah. So uh, what other I'm, tech are you taking? So what other tech? So I'm definitely uh, taking my phone, and I might have something called a Mophie or some sort of a, a rechargeable uh, device for my cell phone. I might have solar 
power packs as well so that I can actually hike and recharge my phone for whatever things. Okay. And, you know, it's it's actually going to depend what environment I'm in. If I'm going, like, you know, on a small backpacking thing, I'm getting rid of this watch. I'm doing the high-altitude watch. Uh, I'm not interested in you figuring out, well, I did this many miles because I can actually improvise by doing something called a pace count. I don't need a watch. You don't need a watch. I don't for that need a watch stuff. for that. So I want to use a watch that's going to be reliable. Um, you know, maybe I'll have some techie things, but it's not going to be this – I watch. Gotcha. And so in your doc, so what about your go bag? You're taking meds, you're taking equipment. It, it, so that is going to depend on what environment I'm in. So if I'm, let's say, in a uh, desert environment, um, maybe I'm in Death Valley or, you know, a lower desert. I'm not going to take altitude medicines. I'm not going to take, you know, steroids or uh, something called acetazolamide for, you know, uh, acute mountain sickness. You wouldn't take any steroids? Oh, I take steroids all the time. <laughs> not necessarily. And it's going to depend I mean, on... I this is an anti-inflammatory for... Right. Not necess- It's going to depend on also the people I'm with, if I'm with anybody. So if I've got somebody that I've done a medical clearance on, because this is what you have to do as the medical person, does somebody have asthma? Maybe wise to take dexamethasone. Maybe wise to take albuterol. I'll take albuterol with me also on high altitude because it helps against high altitude pulmonary edema, sure. at least in the prevention. But in the desert, in the jungle, I'm probably going to take something different. I'm going to take, you know, definitely some stuff for blisters all the time because blisters are very common. I'm going to take stuff for trauma. The most common trauma are going to be scut- uh, cuts and abrasions, lacerations. So I'll take, you know, something to where maybe I could suture. I'll take some glue, something like that but I've also got to be mindful of my medical kit its size because if it's too big and I'm only taking it for myself like the survival kit I'm not going to want to carry it if it's for a larger group of people I might divvy up some of that stuff but Uh, I'm going to carry my own stuff okay that spread some of that out a little bit kind of lighten the load and then two more doc um what about when you go out I'm just imagining do you have frequent check-ins with someone like a base or whatever um you go out with a group of guys, you're going to Death Valley. Is there somebody, you know, in the city that you're checking in with every so often? Day? It, would, it, would that be advisable for the average hiker or whatever? This is outside right. of kind of the pre-hospital sure. uh, setting, but just an average person going out. Would that be advisable? I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea to have uh, leave a plan with somebody that I'm going to go from this place to that place. So it could be going up the Pino Trail from Elena Gallegos, for instance, saying I'm going to be here and there, and I hope to be back at this time. Because if, you know, that person doesn't come back and a day has passed, you know, you may consider this person is in trouble could be lost. So that's very basic. Carrying a fully charged cell phone uh, is a good idea. And people can, you know, leave it on airplane mode because you can still be found by search and rescue. It's not the time to be, you know, checking your Instagram account, you know, and people are not present in this day and age. And so, you know, you're going to use up a lot of your battery. A lot of your data, yeah, your battery Ex- for that. Exactly. In, in some more remote places, you know, if you have the capability to carry a satellite phone or one of those uh, GPS trackers like something called the OnSpot, that's kind of a nice idea as well so that you can be found. And, yeah, once in a while I'll check in with people and just say, hey, this is how we're doing. That's always a good idea, especially on more prolonged expeditions. Gotcha. Final question. And boy, I'd like, I just can't wait to hear how you answer this because I don't know if you have a, a solution for this. But if you got it, we're going to bottle it. Me and you are going into business. <laughs> <clears throat> three months without love. Mm. And then you told me I need to have three ways to deal with all of these issues here. So what are my three ways to, to, to deal with the lack of love issue after three months? How do, how do I mitigate that? Well... In, in the simplest terms, what we use that for is you have to have three ways to be able to do a signaling, to be found. So that might include maybe using a flare. Hmm. And flares can actually be very effective in starting a, a campfire as well, but you know you want to save it for the worst case scenario. Actually, a fire, 
if you were to burn green wood after you got your fire going, people see that green smoke and they're going, what's going on over there? A signal mirror is very good as well. So you can flash maybe uh, oncoming, you know, search people if you don't sure. have cell phone capacity or whatnot. Obviously your cell phone. So I'm actually carrying more than three things, but, you know, these are the minimum. A map and compass goes uh, part of that love thing because you have to be able to find yourself out and to be able to master map and compass. So what you're saying is don't be out there for three months. Don't be out there for three months. Right. Have right. tools that will prevent that. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. That now, is. if you want to go into the more psychosocial thing, I think, you know, being able to survive three months without love, it includes, you know, your own belief and, you know, who you are as an individual, your identity, your your faith, whatever faith system you have, a reason to go home. So picture? A picture. picture. A picture of the family or whoever's important to you or whatever's important for you. A reason to live, a reason to get out of your situation. Absolutely. Um, so going forward, and for people that want to... Um, I guess, get involved, what would be the most practical way, you know, for a lay person or even a, a medic here with us, how would they get involved? Well, they could uh, contact the University of New Mexico uh, International Mountain Medicine Center. We're on uh, the website here. Uh, What's that website? It's, uh, I don't know what the website is, but just, just go to UNM. UNM and okay. then capital IMMC or International Mountain Medicine Center. IMMC. We'll probably put it on the uh, page. It'll be located here. Um Okay, and then um, going forward, tell me something exciting. What's what's new? What's on the horizon? Well, virtual reality is something new on the horizon for me. I'm hoping to take six months off and to develop a platform where, especially in this uh, COVID generation where people can't train hands-on or even get together for mannequin simulations, yeah. to be able to train. And so what I have been endearing to do is to try to develop a VR platform. I mean, using the Oculus Quest 2, those crazy goggles. Sure. I mean, it is amazing what you can do with these things. But it hasn't been developed for pre-hospital hospital or search and rescue, mountain rescue uh, people. There are some emergency medicine platforms, programs. We're doing some of that stuff here. I understand that, mm -hmm. and that's exciting. So mm -hmm. hopefully we can collaborate to develop that for, for learners that can learn in the confines of their living room as long as they don't stay away from other people for more than three months because there's no love. <laughs> there's <laughs> you no know? love. Well, on that note, everybody, <laughs> that's all the time we have for today. Um, Really appreciate you, Doc, uh, for coming by. I uh, wish we could talk more. Maybe we should get together again, and we'll kind of expand this topic. Let's do it, Lieutenant. Um, I'm for, all ears. Thank yeah. you. And for all of you out there, um, remember, stay safe, keep your love tank full, mm. and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Right on.